Islam doesn't just have rules for Muslims. Islam also has rules for non-Muslims. These are rules that are to be imposed on non-Muslims whenever possible. Imposing Islamic rules on non-Muslims is fairly easy to do in Muslim countries. Just ask the non-Muslims who are in prison for blasphemy in places like Pakistan or Saudi Arabia. But things can get a bit trickier in non-Muslim countries. That's where Muslim speakers and leaders and apologists have to get creative. Suppose you're a Muslim apologist in a non-Muslim country, and you realize that non-Muslims are criticizing Muhammad. What do you do? One option is to acknowledge their right to criticize Muhammad and to calmly and peacefully respond to their criticisms. But who are we kidding? This is Islam. Non-Muslims have to be manipulated, conditioned, and controlled. So you have to find a way to control their behavior. You can start by calling them Islamophobes. If that doesn't work, you can call them racists. If that doesn't work, you can be like Muhammad Hijab and send them messages about golden showers and threaten their wives. If that doesn't work, you can be like Ali Dawa and pray for Allah to curse them with diseases. If that doesn't work, you can be like Ijaz Ahmed and dox them. If that doesn't work, you can be like Menj and get caught with a bunch of child pornography. If that doesn't work, you can call in the big gun, Dr. Zucker Nike. Dr. Nike was recently asked what Muslims can do about non-Muslims who are attacking Islam. He was mainly focused on non-Muslim critics in India, but his words of wisdom can certainly be applied elsewhere. At first, Dr. Nike sounded very peaceful. Your, what should we do? As Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Fusilah, chapter number 41, verse number 34, repel evil with good. You may never know the, per, the person who is your enemy will become your friend. So if they are abusing you, if they are calling you with names, illogically blaming you, repel evil with good. You be kind to them. Be kind to them. What a lovely message. Unfortunately, Dr. Nike made it clear that the be kind to them approach only applies in places where Muslims are completely outnumbered and are unable to enforce Islamic law. You be good to them. As far as we in India, we should soften their hearts. And as Allah says, you may never know that the enemy will become your friend. But there are countries where Muslims outnumber the non-Muslims and the Muslims are able to enforce Sharia. Dr. Nike has a totally different approach in these countries. Non-Muslims who criticize Islam should be prosecuted. This backlash that came from the Gulf country, it should have come long before, but better late than never. And I agree with it that they gave the warning and many of them were arrested. They were put in jails. Many were sent back. So in non-Muslim countries, Muslims can't enforce Sharia. Hence, they should try to melt people's hearts with kindness. But in Muslim countries, non-Muslims can simply be thrown in prison for criticizing Islam. Notice, if you've got a diabolical mind, you could put together a plot here. You could keep records of critics of Islam in non-Muslim countries and then wait for them to travel to a Muslim country. Once they enter a Muslim country, you could prosecute them for what they said about Islam in their non-Muslim countries. And that's exactly the plot that Zakir Naik came up with. That even collect the data of all the negative remarks and abusive of all the non-Muslims in India and keep a data bank and store it into the computer. Next time if they come to the Gulf country, whether it be Kuwait, whether it be to Saudi Arabia, whether it be to Dubai, whether it be to Indonesia, in the data bank you should be mentioned, okay, now they have abused the Prophet, which is not permitted by law, and they have abused Islam, bid them to task, have a case against them, Arrest them and put them behind bar. Make it public that we have a data bank. Don't reveal the names. The moment they come, arrest them, take them to the court of law, give them punishment. Believe me, most of these people who are BJP bhakt, who are spreading venom against Islam, against the Muslim, they will get scared. Putting all of this together, we've got Zakir Naik's plot to silence critics of Islam. When someone criticizes Islam in India or Europe or America, Muslims should be kind to the critic. 
But while Muslims are being kind to the critic, they should also be keeping careful records of what the critic says about Muhammad and the Quran, because if the critic is ever traveling to a Muslim country or through a Muslim country, he can be arrested and imprisoned or, in certain places, sentenced to death. This will frighten other critics of Islam into keeping their mouths shut about Muhammad and the Quran. Interestingly, this idea to keep records on critics of Islam didn't start with Zakir Naik. Muslim apologists have been keeping tabs on us for years. For instance, Ijaz Ahmed recently apologized following a backlash over his use of a racial slur and his doxing of a debate opponent. But it's difficult to take his apology seriously because he's been plotting this for years. As Paul Williams shared, Ijaz Ahmed and I were once friends back in the day. He confided to me how he kept detailed records of people he considered enemies, usually Christians. Their names, full addresses, family members, telephone numbers, anything he could find. He boasted how he had a way of finding out information. Bewildered, I asked him why on earth would he want to compile such a database. He muttered something about it being useful just in case, but did not offer a clear rationale. But I was very disturbed. He was behaving like a covert intelligence officer compiling personal information on others to be used against them one day. He told me that he had highly personal data about certain well-known individuals. That was several years ago. Now this video surfaces recording how Ijaz Ahmed published personal and sensitive information about people in the public domain. In other words, doxing. This is shocking, but far from surprising. People should be aware of this background. One of the most disturbing features of Islam is its obsession with controlling what people can say and what people can do. Blasphemy laws, terrorist attacks, threats, abuse, insults, doxing, these are all tools in the jihadi's tool belt to help him control what you say and what you do. But to the Zakir Naik's and the Ijaz Ahmed's and the Muhammad Hijab's and the Ali Dawa's of the world, let me say, you will never stop us from criticizing your fake prophet and his stupid, stupid book. Why? Because too much depends on our success in exposing your fake prophet. The future of humanity is at stake here. So your little plots just aren't going to work. But no matter how clearly we explain our reasoning, you Muslim apologists never seem to understand why we insist on criticizing and mocking your fake prophet, even in the face of threats and intimidation. So I think we should finally lay down some ground rules. Here are Wood's four rules of fair criticism. Rule number one. If your prophet calls for our violent subjugation, then we get to criticize and mock him. Rule number two. If your prophet promotes hatred and contempt and bigotry towards us and towards our families and towards our friends, then we get to criticize and mock him. Rule number three. If your prophet is responsible through his teachings and through his example for terrible states of affairs in the world today, such as the oppression of women in Muslim countries and the persecution of non-Muslim minorities in Muslim countries, then we get to criticize and mock him. Rule number four. If your prophet had sex with a prepubescent girl and married the wife of his own adopted son, and received revelations that gave him special moral privileges, and thought he was demon-possessed, and tried repeatedly to hurl himself off a cliff, and claimed to be the victim of a magic spell that gave him delusional thoughts and false beliefs, and admittedly delivered revelations from the devil, and declared that the sun sets in a muddy pool and that stars are missiles that God uses to shoot demons, and ordered his followers to drink camel urine and to squat while peeing, and walked around covered in semen and sucked on the tongues of little boys, then we get to criticize and mock him. Those are the rules. And guess what? Your prophet did call for our violent subjugation. He did promote hatred and contempt and bigotry towards us and towards our families and towards our friends. He is responsible, through his teachings and through his example, 
for terrible states of affairs in the world today. He did have sex with a prepubescent girl. He did marry the wife of his own adopted son. He did receive revelations that gave him special moral privileges. He did think he was demon-possessed. He did try repeatedly to hurl himself off a cliff. He did claim to be the victim of a magic spell that gave him delusional thoughts and false beliefs. He did admittedly deliver revelations from the devil. He did declare that the sun sets in a muddy pool and that stars are missiles that God uses to shoot demons. He did order his followers to drink camel urine and to squat while peeing. He did walk around covered in semen. He did suck on the tongues of little boys. Therefore, according to all reasonable and just rules of criticism and mockery, we get to criticize and mock the false prophet Muhammad and his silly revelations. And if you keyboard jihadis have a problem with that, then you have my full permission to cry me a river. But under no circumstances do you get to silence us or in any other way impose the commands of an illiterate 7th century caravan robber on us. And he attempts to silence us, whether through terror or threats or doxing or deplatforming or luring us to a Muslim country to have us prosecuted, will result in even more relentless criticism and mockery. Like it or not, your prophet is the most mockable person in history, and it's completely, utterly, totally his fault. He said what he said. He did what he did. His teachings and his actions are on him. So if you don't want us mocking your prophet, get a new prophet. Just make sure your new prophet is the exact opposite of that child-molesting, wife-beating, slave-trading, promise-breaking, captive-raping moron you're following now. For those of you who don't follow history's most obvious false prophet, be sure to check out some of my other responses to Zakir Naik. I know he makes it easy by using such dumb arguments, but just because he makes it easy doesn't mean it's not fun.